Greetings, everyone, um, tuning in on uh, Facebook Live and um, YouTube. My name is Sithio Mahala. Uh, welcome to the 25th Time of the Writer, organized under the theme Beyond Words, Memory, Imagination, and Conscience. Um, we are in conversation with uh, Manja Langa, a South African writer, born in Deben and grew up in Guamashu. Um, he's an award-winning writer, and most definitely one of the most prolific and uh, a foremost um, public intellectual in South Africa. He's been recognized uh, by many institutions. Um, most recently, uh, he, he got uh, two honorary doctorates, one from Vest University, the other from the University of Forte, uh, quite interestingly, he was kicked out of Forte in 1972 uh, because he was a troublemaker. And then um, in 2017, he was then honored with, a, with an honor doctorate. Uh, he's an author of several books. I can't count all of them, but amongst them, I can mention Memory of Stones, uh, The Lost Colors of the Chameleon, Text of Shadows, and the latest one, which will be uh, the subject of our discussion today, uh, is uh, the lost language of the soul. So without further ado, um, before you know, discussing the book, I would ask him uh, to uh, give us a tidbits from, from the book. So over to you, Bramanda. Well, thank you very much, uh, CPO. Uh, for this, uh, for agreeing to doing this. I'm not sure, do you want me to read or you want me to talk about the book? Yeah, maybe you read first um, and then we will discuss thereafter. Okay. This part I'm reading in the book is a, a part where the young uh, protagonist uh, Joseph, who is 14 years old, uh, half Zambian, half, half South African, he has smuggled himself into a car, a truck of guerrillas who are en route to South Africa, who are crossing the river. And uh, so here now, he has a uh, the car is in motion. The stretch of emptiness stares at them. It is relieved by oddly shaped rocks, boulders, and termite mounds on the ground, bleached the color of khaki by the sun. A clump of rocks standing atop others screw their faces like human beings, tasting something bitter. Here, a bent old man with a crescent-shaped beard, then old woman balancing a calabash on her head. With every mile traveled, the shadows grow longer and longer. It is now late in the afternoon. The sun peers redly over the hills and wisps of clouds are tinged with orange. Scraggy bushes sprout up in places that look impossibly dry. A desert, a small well wind sucks up papers and twigs and, and other objects and sets them dancing before freeing them into emptiness. Far in the distance shimmers a lake, which Joseph knows is a mirage. The roads stretches on and on and disappears below low hills to emerge even narrower than before, tapering into a memory on the horizon. The guerrillas are then discussing where they are, they are in Botswana. So where are we, Joseph asks. He's bolder now that he knows they won't chuck him out, at least for the moment. Out in the sticks in Botswana, Charlie says, he peers in the, at the desolation fleeting past, 
my man or me, the Botswana Fangele is not even fucking remorse. Yeah, Kwaza says, it's desolate, but at least they are independent, the Botswana. They have a country and a flag, remorse or not. And they are just a stateless guerrilla. Charlie says, at least I'm fighting to win back a developed country. Di Deng Yi. Charlie points out to the spread of scrubland where a piece of farming machinery stands rotting in the sun. Further into the middle distance, a couple of hearts and lintus have arisen from the ground. A group of curious children watch the car, thumbs jammed into their mouths, kicked down, and so on and so on. So Charlie is very uh, contemptuous of the, uh, how do you call it? Of the Bundu life of the Botswana. That's one of the parts that I really enjoyed writing because as I was writing that, it evoked a memory of the Botswana that I knew when I was there in exile. Well, th thanks for that, Ramanja. Well, th there's many more. I mean, I, I was part of uh, Joseph's journey all the way from Zambia down south via Botswana and finally in, in KZN. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of questions about that. But before we get there, you are the featured writer of Time of the Writer the 20, in the 25th anniversary of the festival. What does this mean to you? <clears throat> You know, yesterday when I listened to Dr. Nogutula Mazibugum Simang making her um, opening keynote speech and touched on quite a number of very important points about the history of this country. In essence, the history as seen through the work and travails and struggles and commitment of one uh, Chief Albert Mvumbi Lutuli. It made me think of the onerous weight of what it means to be a South African and for me then to be given this, I'll, I'll, I'll call it a responsibility, you know, to be a lot more conscious of the role of the writer in ensuring and ushering change in a country like ours. Now I know that many would say that, but we have attained our freedom, so we don't need any more uh, agitation, any more uh, polemic, any more writing that points to the problems because after Mandela was released, everything is angitory. And the truth is that the problems then that we face today are a lot more complex. And so a writer has got a role. Uh, what did uh, Amiri Paraga says? The role of, of a writer in, a, in society is to be the thorn that pricks society, galvanize it into action. And uh, so for me, I take this uh, honor, responsibility very seriously. And I think that uh, I'm, you know, humbled by the time of the writer to have been chosen. Wonderful. Um, well, having said that, I, you know, uh, Dr. Mazibuko Msimang yesterday mentioned something about your work exploring um, you know, uh, taking a critical view on history. And that got me thinking, I, I went back to, to most of your novels where you really explore history. So I wanted to know, and I think also the organizers of, of the festival took this into consideration when they chose you as the, as the official writer, that you, you explore a memory in your work um, in most of these novels. Why is it important to go back to history in, you know, uh, in, in our present moment? 
Mm. I think one of the most uh, sometimes disconcerting things about our new democracy is the capacity we have for forgetting. And so the novelist, the writer, uh, has got to play a role, I think, as much as possible to remind people. Someone would say to remind people of the places where the times when the people who and the reason why. And so it's a role that uh, one has, I have thrust upon myself to act as somebody that will forever be reminding people, reminding myself, because when you write, the first person that you've got to convince is yourself. I've got to remember, there's a poem by someone, I think it's Haki Matubudi, who says, remember to, to remember the unremembered. And so in writing, you are paying homage to the thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women who in their own small way carried the weight of that oppression, carried the weight of that commitment and ensured that some kind of uh, route was made towards creating a livable future. And you will realize that uh, for most of the time, some of the novels really explore the theme of exile. And when it comes to that, it's because those who live, who go into other countries, they are actually trying to find their country in all these foreign climes. It was David Hare who once said that an exile goes into the world carrying in his head or her head the image of a perfect universe. So we are trying to recreate a perfect universe through writing, through memory, but much more importantly, through imagination. And I think you try as much as possible to be as full of uh, integrity, which is where conscience comes in. Okay. Yeah, well, you, you do that very well. Um, but also, um, when I read uh, the novel, I, I believe it is, you know, it is Joseph in search of his mother. Um, but to me, it's also uh, a quest for, 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 for identity. Um, and my interest is, why <clears throat> did you decide to, to do this through the eyes of a child, of a 14-year-old boy? Mm. You know, I've always been interested in how young people see the world. That's why I would stay with my own children and quiz them about how they look at reality. But when it comes to the issue of Joseph, Joseph uh, is, rep represents for me the kind of tension that obtains in our country where we have a case of people uh, the South Africans whose freedom, whether they like this or not, is also predicated on the role that was played by the international community, by the role that of people, the men and women who are unsung heroes and heroines in those dust bowls of countries who really um, sacrificed everything to make sure that one day the children of South Africa would finally find a home. And so, in a sense, uh, Joseph's looking for his mother is, of course, can be read as a, a metaphor for all of us looking for something that can sustain us 
as 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 human beings um, and some get lost in that process but finally some do reach their promised land yeah well i i hear the uh, about the uh possible metaphoric significance of it but i still have questions about uh joseph's father um in fact throughout you know, I remained with questions, but I don't want to give too much away. But here on page uh, 388, uh, the last line of the first paragraph, um, or the, the last three lines of the first paragraph, you say, mothers stay and sometimes think about what's been done to them in places where silences are cultivated. We reap a harvest of screams as is happening here tonight. And so I call on the bones that were unearthed and reburied today. But yeah, I, I still have that question. You know, the mothers are there, but what is the, what is the story about the fathers? Look, um, we live in a patriarchal world. We live in a patriarchal society and we can't run away from that. Our role as writers is to invest the mothers, the women, with as much possibilities of agency as, as we can master. And so uh, even in the liberation movement, I'm hoping that, that this becomes a talking point. What is the role of women? Because when you say mother, everywhere, be it in Kuala Lumpur or in Shanghai, everybody knows that you are dealing with something that sustains a people, something that ensures longevity, regeneration. And, and fathers, uh, everybody can become a father, but no, very few people can become mothers. So in a sense, as writers, I would want to enjoin us as much as possible to give a much more, much more important role to women uh, for what they have endured and for what they've done and for what they are doing. And so this is my small contribution to that possibility. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't uh, follow the the nomenclature of the of the military is it a battalion that uh, the, the the you know the female character is is leading? No, she's leading a platoon or a squad. It's, it's, it's called a, a platoon. Yeah, we can call it a, a a a squad really because a platoon is something that can be perhaps twenty people, and the section can be about nine people or 11. So she's leading a section of guerrillas in pure military uh, uh, parlance. Yeah, well, I, I, I see you've, you've assumed the, 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 the Patel character now. <laughs> <laughs> so your combat name was or still is Patel. How did that come about? When I left Lesotho, uh, after having been in Botswana, I left Lesotho and went to Mozambique. Now, once you're in Mozambique, in fact, we stayed in Matola, in exactly those places which were later uh, bombed by the, by the regime. Uh, you have to have a combat name, and my name, which I was given by uh, Another writer, his name is Vusi Mavimbela, but his combat name then was Klaus Mapepa. So he called me Patel, a name that has given me a lot of uh, grief in the sense that it's unmistakably an Indian name or an Asian name. Even the president of the ANC uh, in Lusaga then, uh, President Oartambo once asked me, why do they call you Patel? 
and he, he really had a good gig like that. So yeah, <laughs> that was that was my name. Still is my name. <laughs> yeah. Because the struggle is not over. Yes. Oh, thank you, Patel. Um, <laughs> But, but since you touched on your journey um, uh, to exile, I believe it touched in, in uh, Botswana, which place, um, I remember you, you went with, with some comrades, some in the arts, and there is a place where uh, after you arrived, um, you know, one of uh, you, you asked the, the only pair of jeans you had. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? No. In which country was that? No, that was actually in in the house of uh, Rawili Hositsile. We were, we were coming from Nigeria, from Vestak in 1977. And so I stayed in his house and he had all these books, fantastic books I had never seen before. And I'd washed my pair of jeans, uh, jeans I had worn all the way from leaving the country. And so uh, I was reading something, I think it was a book by Leroy Jones then, before he became Imam Amiri Barak. And I was so engrossed in that. And my my clothes were being were drying on the edge <laughs> when <laughs> I heard this sound, <laughs> this hoshu hoshu, you know this. And then when I looked up, I saw my jeans slowly just taking a walk, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was that. I jumped uh, to try and chase this guy. And he had both of them under, because it was a, a suit under his arm. And I've never seen such athleticism as I did that day, the way he sprang over those. And I, I said to myself that uh, there was a Tanzanian um, athlete called Philippet Bai. I thought that he must have been possibly trained by him or had been in, in his stable. He was, you end up admiring the efficacy, the efficiency of that escape. There, my jeans, yeah, that's how they went. <laughs> ah, well, I, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> uh, Patel went through that uh, experience. Yeah. But um, you, you also, in some ways, uh, pay tribute to Ual Tambo. Why is that so, amongst others, by the way? You know, I think uh, at some stage, some time back, uh, uh, Fidel Castro, when he met with OR, he asked him, how do you manage to have so many thousands of people uh, in camps training in exile without a major upheaval. He said to Tambo, I would never uh, put my Cuban soldiers in the barracks. There would be a mutiny. And Tambo said to him that uh, the most important thing that uh, Fidel Castro should remember is that the people here are political soldiers. They are not just, you know, uh, people that are going to get arms and go and wreak havoc. They are here because of a political ideal. And so for 30 years to have kept a movement in, in, in the way the ANC MK was kept, was almost a, a small miracle uh, without it, you know, going uh, asunder. And so he was a person that really listened. He was a leader that led from the front and uh, there was no uh, whiff of corruption 
or corruptibility. He was a, an epitome of integrity. And so I felt that South Africa is a country that could have benefited hugely from that kind of leadership. Hence, this homage to him. Okay, great. And you, you describe him as, as a president South Africa never had. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I see you as the Minister of Arts and Culture South Africa never had. Well, I think that's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> so my interest with, uh, with this background, having spent so many years in exile and um, having been uh, you know, in the trenches alongside many other people. I mean, today we, at least you have a, a combat name that we know there is a, a, you know, slight evidence that you were in the trenches. Now there are questions about people, whether they were there or not. And those issues remain unclear. But why didn't you take up, that's, this is my interest, why didn't you take up a political office after you returned from exile? Why did I not take up a political office? Yes. Look. In other uh, ways, why did you deprive us the opportunity of being led uh, <laughs> by uh, a, a, an artist and uh, well, well respected uh, public intellectual? I think it's uh, anybody that hoists himself into a leadership position does not deserve that position. In fact, someone once said that um, politics is lost, uh, or, you know, the issue of leadership is lost on the politicians. And so, or is wasted on politicians. I would believe that uh, it is only when people ask you or put you in that position, not so much to lead, but to act as a guide, as a touchstone, uh, then that's something that can be, but I would never really um, put myself up and say, uh, I would like to lead this uh, ministry, this organization. I think uh, I've seen too much ruin, uh, too many good people going sometimes with good intentions into some of these uh, circumstances and they end up being contaminated by something that perhaps they were not ready for. I, uh, I believe, I believe, uh, you know, we have a lot of people that are keeping this country steady who are not in positions of leadership, you know. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think I must confess that um, I started stalking you in the, in the 90s. Uh, I was um, I, still a student in the Eastern Cape. You were the executive chairperson of, uh, of a castle. And I was just, I didn't even know at the time that you were a writer. I was just attracted you know, by your uh, calm demeanor and uh, obvious intellect. And I always look forward to, to your interviews in the news. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, back to, 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 to uh, the story, the lost language of the, of the soul. You know, what scared me, I, I really got scared uh, when reading and getting an impression that there could be people in the high echelons of power who are, you know, uh, who, who were actually uh, agents or enemy agents uh, back in the day during the liberation struggle. How possible is that? You know, one of the one of the things we need to remember uh, at some time there was there used to be a minister in the apartheid cabinet called Magnus Malan, 
I think he became at some stage a minister of defense. And he was somebody that had been trained by the best, so to say, intelligence uh, apparatuses and institutions the world over, whatever, West Point and the rest of it. So he knew the military, he knew security, he knew counterintelligence, etc. And one of the things he wrote about was to say that politics, the way politics in South Africa can be won, uh, it's 80% uh, non-military and 20% military. Now the non-military aspect consists of a number of features, including intelligence. Now, if you look at the, at the, at the budget of BOSS, the Bureau of State Security, of the, of the, you know, all the money that they had, they had more money than some smaller countries, you know, GDP of small countries on the African continent. Where, what was that being used for? That was being used to make sure that the problem that we presented as part and parcel of the liberation struggle would one day, that problem would one day turn around and smite us. And what we're seeing today, we're seeing the fruits of the investment that the Magnus Malans and them put in making sure that they have people who are going to always make sure that the project of liberation gets to be frustrated somewhere along the line. Because right now, all of us are busy clawing at each other. And if you look at that very seriously, you must say to yourself that this can't just be because black people are unable to run their, their, their issues. There must be something that is fueling this. Just last year in July, July 12, we had the, you know, that conflagration. For me, I might be wrong, but for me, that thing could not have just ignited out of nowhere you know, or sprouted up like mushrooms after a storm. They must have been something that fueled that. So these people took a long view. They took a long view. They work in the same way as, for instance, either the Chinese or any other country that takes itself seriously. That we've got a 30 year um, view of where we want to be. And in those 30 years, something that they planted a long, long time ago, you know, uh, gives fruit. So we really do need to think very seriously where we are, what kind of people have been posing as our leaders who might have been one way or the other uh, infected by exactly the largesse of the Magnus Malans. Well, um, perhaps I should have uh, declared this upfront. The street I live in is, is named after Magnus Malan. <laughs> and I was never an enemy agent. <laughs> I was too young. To... <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but talking about this, Romandla, you, you, there is somewhere where you actually captured it so well in the book. I'll find the, 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 the extra because I did mark it. But uh, you also have a, a personal story to tell uh, in relation to this. Um, your family was affected by, by such things. Hmm. Do, do, do you mind sharing? Well, I think that uh, uh, I'm, I'm always... Uh, dismayed whenever people point to others as enemy agents because in our family this is something that uh, happened when one of my brothers Ben 
who was a uh, a much more committed person than even I. Uh, we were out in Lusaga when we heard that he had been shot dead. And uh, the long and short of the story is that Ben was killed by two members of MK. Uh, and one of them was somebody who had been in the camps with me in my section, and I was his section commissar. Mm -hmm. And so, and he came from Guamashu. And so Ben gets killed uh, because he has been tagged an informer or an enemy agent. Much, much later, it transpires that the person that labeled him thus was himself working for the enemy. In fact, could have been responsible for a lot more deaths, including the, the, the massacre that happened in Madola, the raid that happened in Madola. He was based in Swaziland. And so when he gets to be uncovered, he gets interrogated and dies under interrogation. So in a sense, for me, it means a lead to something much more important was lost. But that's how it happened. And then the ANC had to uh, apologize to our family at, uh, and uh, made a declaration at the, at the TRC. And uh, even when uh, my other brother passed away, uh, Chief Justice Pius Langa, uh, the then President Zuma did speak about this matter as something that had brought a lot of uh, uh, distress to our family. So uh, it's a horrible story. It's a horrible personal story, but it's also a story that in a sense made me attuned to the issues of betrayal, to the issues of um, what you see might not necessarily be what you get insofar as the kinds of people that we run with, we walk with, who are part and parcel of this journey that we have taken. Wow, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Romanja. Uh, but you have another brother, uh, a baby, sorry, um, a baby. baby. Mm. Yeah, so at some point, uh, the three remaining brothers had dreamed of becoming, uh, of having a law firm uh, <laughs> called Langa, Langa and Langa. Langa, Langa and Langa. Yes. And what happened to you? You... you just about the only one who, who never really had a, a real job end up uh, busy with ways. <laughs> no, uh, well, I, I really did want to become a lawyer at some stage, but then I saw all the law books, which are full of footnotes and citations. And uh, I, I, I really never, so at Forte, I did arts, English history, political science, and uh, and so forth. So I jumped ship, really, when it comes to Langa and Langa and Langa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there are some comments, so please keep them coming. We will read them uh, and, and, uh, and um, ask questions if there are any questions. Uh, but Ramanja, talking about um, your education, your studies were obviously interrupted in, uh, in 1972. And, um, but despite that, you got honorary doctorates from two different universities. Why did you see the need after having gotten all of uh, uh, you know, those adulations? Why did you see the need to then go and, and study towards a master's degree, um, which I, I believe this book is a product of your master's program. 
mm. which you got from the University of of uh, Vedvasas Rand. Right. You know, I I I I'm always of the belief that you you have to be learning until you die, and the minute you start thinking that you've got all the answers, is the minute that you start to die actually, or your brain starts dying. Uh, as a writer, I mean, I've been writing for God knows how many years. And I believe that I've accumulated quite a sizable number of bad habits in writing. And so uh, the VETS uh, master's program was in a, a wish on my side to put myself within certain strictures of discipline to find out what it is that also I can be taught, I can learn from others. And it was a very, very important uh, cause in the sense that I was with a lot of young people, young writers from very, very different backgrounds. And the feedback uh, that you get from people and the feedback that you give to people uh, was important in the sense that something organic was being built in that uh, encounter of, of, of that master's program. And uh, if there would be a possibility to do that again, I would do it, uh, possibly looking at other aspects of writing because it's such a vast field with ever so many different features that, uh, I, for instance, I would like to look at what people who write flash fiction, what is it that they do? People that write anthropological fiction or who write science fiction, what, what makes them tick? And so the, this, I think it's a lifelong possibility of getting uh, to understand. And getting to understand others is the best way of getting to understand yourself. Wow. Well, I hear you are talking about flash fiction, but um, I believe you owe us an autobiography, Amanda. When are you gonna, when are we getting it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, if there's one thing, I think it was uh, some other writer, I can't remember who it was, who said that she's got a big problem with anything that has got to start with her using I. And uh, so I also am not an I specialist. I really, really struggle with the first person narrative. It's only now I'm working on, a, on another book that I'm using the first person narrative. I've always sublimated my own experiences in the experiences of others, characters, etc. as I do believe most writers do. So it will take me, I don't know, a heck of a long time before I really sit down and say, I was born in Stenga on such and such a day. My father was a minister of religion. I don't know. <laughs> and and what, what happened to you? Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> but yeah, um, well, I, I do believe that you, your personal story is important. We get glimpses of it in your work. Um, but it will be quite interesting when uh, people don't have to guess uh, if you really struggle uh, the, you know, the, the apartheid period and the post-apartheid period and being actively involved uh, uh, in both eras. I think not too many people can give uh, the kind of account you can give about the, the, the history of the liberation struggle in South Africa as well as our um, the transitional period, because um, uh, this book touches a lot 
on the transitional period leading up to, 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 to 94. Uh, all the skirmishes that were happening, the hostels uh, in, uh, in, in KZN and in all such places. Um, to some people, it, it, might, it might seem um, too far-fetched, maybe thinking you're using too much of your uh, uh, poetic license. But many of the things, the likes of measles uh, do exist. Um, and actually, there are parts that I, I want to read before we go back to, to, to the comments. Okay. Um, here it says, uh, this is page uh, 316. By the way, the book is published by Picado Africa. Uh, it says, the regime is ready to play the long game. It fills its agents everywhere. The objective, because the regime knows it has lost the political game, is to perpetuate itself through the ascendancy to power of its agents. It cultivates them to, to be effective in the liberation movement, to rise and take up leadership positions with a simple aim to make post-apartheid independence unworkable. That's, that's scary. I mean, th this is part of, of, of what really um, I felt it was an eye-opener and it, it makes one think deeply about where we are and where we are headed. And um, yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for, for bringing this, this, this perspective. Um, mm -hmm. let, let, let me read quickly what uh, yeah. uh, Aisha Kaji wrote on Facebook. She says, Amanda Langa thus positioning of women, not only as mothers who birth the future, but also as sustainers and redeemers, redeemers of life and of dreams and hopes. Thank you. This is just thanking you. What, what do, do you have anything, any, any comment? No, I, 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 I appreciate that really. You know, I appreciate that, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, there, there are a whole lot more uh, other comments that, uh, that uh, I, I, I mean, uh, extracts that I could read from the book. But um, you seem to be saying in the book um, the violence that claimed the lives of many people. Um, in the in the early nineties during the tran transitional period, um, leading up to ninety four, um, was was not necessarily what was then uh, uh, interpreted as uh, black on black violence. What are the possibilities uh, as you see it and? Where do you see some of those agents today? Um, I'm asking because, you know, particularly between 91, 92, 93, there was a lot of violence in the KZN area. And KZN and, and Gauteng mainly in the country. And again, um, uh, we ex experienced something similar with the July unrest. And again, affecting primarily these uh, parts of these two provinces. And fortunately, I hope that was arrested successfully. I, I, I do hope. But what could be, do you think we could be sitting on a time bomb as a society? Uh, I believe that um, if we don't go and explore, you know, and dispassionately the reasons why certain things happened in the past, we will forever be menaced by these uh, circumstances, these events, these violations. I believe that, um, for instance, when the truth and reconciliation process, there was 
hope that it would also become a lot more, um, you know, it would investigate and really become forensic in a manner that uh, would apportion a culpability exactly where it needed to be apportioned. But what happened was this became very patchy and, and I think ultimately unsatisfactory. I think there's a phrase which I think James Baldwin used in uh, uh, The Devil Finds Work, where he speaks of violence and speaks of the issue of blood cries for blood. The fact that uh, as we sit here, many, many, many people who could be in situations like mine where there was wrongdoing and there was no redress. In such situations, you will find people then uh, trying to find, blundering into ways of trying to deal and with the redress themselves. And, you know, you look at, for instance, the, especially where the leadership is weak. If the leadership is weak, people do not have any trust in any uh, agency that can be part and parcel towards redressing their, their, their problems or what they have endured, what they've experienced. And so we've got a bottled up polity, you know, people that feel that we have to find a way of solving this. And opportunists and agents of the apartheid regime of the past secure, security experts seize on this, seize on that discontent. And then it becomes magnified and becomes much huger than it's supposed to be. You know, look at what happened in KZN. Uh, so these are some of the things that need to be explored. But South Africa has lost, I think, the capacity to call, I'll, call, I'll, I'll just call it an imbizo, where people can really say, these are things that bother us. What can we do to make sure because even though there is violence, South Africans are incredibly, um, you know, well forgiving people. Once they know that they're not being taken on a ride, they go with you, they will die for you. But if they have a suspicion that, you know, this is not what, uh, what is being done in their name is not correct, then there'll be trouble. It's something that the leadership has got to be very alive to. And we are at a time in 2022 when opportunism, political opportunism is so rife, it's become second nature, you know. And uh, it doesn't help that all of us are publishers now. All of us have got cell phones. All of us can write anything that can inflame, you know, no matter how crass it might be. So we need, as South Africans, to remember who we are. We need to <laughs> actually really, as Dr. Um, Mazubuom Simang said yesterday, we need to move beyond words. And I think something needs to prick our consciences. Well, wow, thank you. Um, it's the second time you, you mentioned Baldwin in this conversation. And uh, in the book, you, you do in some way um, uh, pay tribute or uh, cross-reference uh, um, other writers, including Margaret Walker and uh, uh, Brawa Lisi Rote. Why is this important? I believe that uh, as writers, we need to pay homage to one another, 
that is the only way we can, this tree, this fruit can grow, can, you know, it's a, uh, we are lucky that as South African writers, for instance, we do not have those uh, kerfuffles that you found, for instance, your, when uh, um, Langston Hughes fought with Imam Amiri Paraga, we don't have that. People do try to appreciate, and I think we need to really, really deepen that. Mm. Mm. Okay, thanks, Lorenzo. Well, we, we're running out of time, but um, I would like to to read some of the comments we've received, and okay. then um, if you can, um, you know, wrap up in two minutes uh, your response. Uh, so this one is from Kai Cruz Chisano, uh, who okay. says, or oh, who quotes, our role as writers is to invest mothers, women, with as much possibility of agency that we can master. Uh, she's copy, co quoting you. Uh, yeah. So I absolutely love this, Manja, spot on. So an, another person who approves of your articulations here. Um, and Aisha Kaji comes back again to say, Manja Langa, I hope you do know that Patel is Parsi, you saw in Parsi and Hindi and uh, Gujarati refers to the leader, headman of a village. And you do know it takes a village to start a revolution, right? <laughs> My leader. So actually you were supposed to have been a headman, but uh, you grew up in Gomash. So you forfeited <laughs> those privileges. And then here is Dr. Mazibu Gomsimang. Getting to understand others is the best way to get to understand yourself. Again, quoting you. And then she says, stories of exile are few, a big gap that exists in our memory as a people. An autobiography or an unauthorized biography. Okay, I'm getting confused by this part. She says, by Spio Mahala about Mandalanga's life and times is a must. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I don't think I can write about you, but uh, there, there should be someone who writes about you. But since you're still capable, we are looking forward to that autobiography. Your last remarks, Pramanja? No, I welcome the possibility of you writing the, the biography, Spiro. And uh, I'll give you whatever help you need. <laughs> and uh, in terms of the other comments, thank you so much uh, for being such generous uh, listeners, audiences. I think we need to take seriously the fact that some of these initiatives, like the time of the writer, are food for the soul. And uh, what has gone on in the past 48 hours, for instance, in so far as the time of the writer, are things that I will treasure forever, the speeches, the keynote address, and also the exchanges between people, the exchanges here that you were. Uh, Aisha's comment on uh, Patel, I will start uh, acting like a leader now, Aisha. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ramanja, for finally fulfilling our lunch dates. Um, I've been looking forward to, to this moment, except that there was no lunch per se, but we got food uh, for the soul. Um, I feel intellectually stimulated. So thank you so much for sharing not only about the, the book, but uh, your life as well. Um, uh, so th th this means a great deal to me. So we ended there uh, our session with the uh, featured writer of the 25th Time of the Writer, Manja Langa. Um, time of the Writer, as we said earlier, is organized under the theme Beyond Words, Memory, Imagination, and co Conscience. Thank you for tuning in. Um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.